This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. This is how the novelist L.P. Hartley begins his well-known novel, The Go-Between. The study of history is the best inoculation students of economics can have against the claim that the laws they learn are universally valid. See, what the study of history really shows is that economic doctrines ar arise in certain places at certain times to throw light on the particular problems or concerns of those societies at those times. They don't just start with someone discovering the first glimmers of scientific truth and then moving on to better and better um, explanations. They're limited in time and place. And I think this is what history teaches us, that thought is contingent on the circumstances in which it arises. One of the themes of our sessions has been to set economic ideas into contexts, to relate them to the social, economic, and ideological conditions of their time, and thus I'll give you a sense that uh, there are no absolute truths here, that economic systems arise out of um, the conditions of their day. And uh, one of the most important schools of economics, the German historical school uh, in the 19th century, claimed exactly that, that there are no universal truths, that policies right for one period may be wrong for another period, and that it's crucial to anchor one's understanding um, of, 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 um, of, 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 the, of, of e economics in the particular circumstances of the economies which are of interest. Out of this, you might say that there are two reasons for e economists to study history. The first is to make history better, and the second is to make economics better. I'm going to concentrate mainly on the second. And of course, although, although economics has helped history by, by, by making it more precise, giving it a sharper framework, better data, I'm going to concentrate mainly on the way in which history can make economics better. If history is the study of the particular and economics of the general, the value of history to economics is to enable economists to make their generalizations more concrete and admit their limits. History is the main source of the stylized facts on which the best economists rely for their hypotheses. Yet, economic history has been almost entirely removed from economics courses. I taught a course in economic uh, history at, uh, at Warwick, um, and yet I was aware that there were very, very, uh, very, very few of them left. As William Parker describes it, the institutional context, the social concepts, the moral zeal implicit in the training which economists used to be given through courses in economic history, economic institutions and applied fields have been pushed aside while those fields have been partially transformed into the playgrounds for the imagination of the theorist. So not only, you know, when they haven't been pushed aside, they've been colonized by the theorists. And so they, they're no longer a source of inspiration or education for the theorists. They're just um, fields in which the theorist can hope to apply um, his, his theories. Economists um, are unlikely to find in history uh, nowadays a useful intellectual uh, a resource for understanding the human condition. Indeed, their invasion of the past is rather like a colonial expedition. Equipped, as they think, with their universal models, economists can simply apply them to any topic, past or present, as a hypothesis, using such data as available to test them. <clears throat> uh, uh, the hypotheses are almost always neoclassical hypotheses. Humans always maximize. So when they look into the past, they always find maximizing individuals. They then feel that their views about human nature are confirmed. The consequences of this invasion is to empty economic history of its traditional content. 
economic theory corrupts economic history by foisting on it ahistorical models and inappropriate testing strategy, which merely confirms the model already in the economist's mind. It's beautifully called cliometrics, the corruption of Clio, the ancient muse of history. So what is the use of history to economists? Well, first of all, history as a source of statistics. The standard view is that history provides economists with a field of observations to test their hypotheses, a source of empirical evidence for testing theories, estimating relationships between variables and forecasting future trends. A basic tool of economic history is the time series, any statistical relationship recorded over a period of time. For example, Angus Madison's historical estimates of national income, population, growth rates, and so on, going all the way back you know, for 2,000 years in some cases, um, and, 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 and so the value of statistics, historical or otherwise, is obvious. They provide a check against mere assertion. But it's in that limited sense. They don't actually tell you what happened, but they say you can't say certain things, because if you say certain things, you're going against what we know. So it's a reality check. Um, but you shouldn't be bamboozled by it. Most of the time series in Madison were constructed long after the event. There were no national statistics in 1800, let alone in the times of the Roman Empire, from which some of them date. So Madison's are estimates based on such statistics as were available then, compiled for different purposes and subject to a wide margin of error. The same is true of Thomas Piketty's statistics on economic inequality. This is not to deny their broad usefulness. A time series analysis is a core component, as you know, of econometrics, the attempt to measure statistically the relationship between two or more economic variables in order to infer their future paths. Now, we can think of examples which have been influential. Many attempts to establish an empirical basis for the quantity theory of money. The long time series developed by Simon Kuznets on national income and its components to test for the consumption function. Uh, E.F. Dennison's use of time series to estimate relationships of key inputs into the growth of output. There are, there are statistics relating to business cycles that try and estimate turning points and, and dynamic and accelerating uh, uh, elements. And so in the last 30 or 40 years, there's been an enormous expansion of the database for, um, for, for, for these time series. But as we have already argued, um, econometri econometrics is vastly oversold as a method of um, uh, testing theories. In addition to model specification problems, as soon as you get enough observations, too much time has passed um, to assume that the conditions are stationary. So you have these big, big problems uh, with econometrics. And, and therefore, the idea that you, you, you are, by applying a lot of data um, to a problem, you can get a, a, a um, good answer or a more accurate answer may be misguided. So you get this blindness. You pillage the past. You've got this terrain, and you draw a map which selects a few things, and you then um, think that that gives you um, a, a, an insight into the, into the whole terrain of the past that you're studying. And um, he, uh, Robert Solo, has this devastating criticism of um, econometrics and economists um, in the past as being history blind. You could drop the econometrician into a time machine and they would be able to set themselves up as an economist without even bothering to ask what time and which place. In short, much of the modeling we do depends on assuming that people in the past had essentially the same values and thought processes as we do now. And yet, if you look at really fine essays in economic history, for example, Moses Finley um, on, on the Greek economy, you actually find that people have completely different motives. They don't do their economic transactions for the same reasons as we do in our 
Kenneth Boulding, another critic, the anti-historical school leads to the development of slick technicians who know how to use computers, run massive correlations and regressions, but who do not really know which side of anybody's bread is buttered who are incredibly ignorant of economic institutions, who have no sense at all of the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into the making of economics, and very little sense of any reality beyond their data sets. Has economics really made history better? Well, you can argue that it has. For example, the book by Fogel, Time on the Cross, which is not an econometric example, but an economist look at slavery in the United States, which transformed the studies of, of, of slavery. Because what Fogel established was that slavery was quite efficient, and um, that uh, a lot of people had been arguing that slavery was destined to die out anyway, because it was an inefficient form of using labor, and wage, wage labor was much more efficient. He said, no, slavery was pretty efficient. And um, what that means is that, um, I mean, the implication of it is that um, it wasn't going to die a natural death, and, and therefore you, know, you, you needed actually to, to have a, a huge political con inter intervention to change it. Nick Crafts is a very well-known economic historian. He's also a properly trained neoclassical economist. And so he looks at the past and finds evidence of neoclassical uh, rationality everywhere. In a productive division between economics and economic history, e economists should make various kinds of hypotheses based on stylized facts. And economic historians should think about how and where different models might apply and whether or not historical data is suitable for use for uh, um, uh, uh, given purposes. And what, what Solo concludes is that economists should approach e history with much greater modesty if they approached it in an inquiring rather than in a conquering frame of mind they would see that history could furnish them with a collection of models contingent on society's circumstances, not a single monolithic model for all seasons. In other words, you know, he endorses basically the German historical school approach. You have um, horses for courses, you could put it that way. And then not assume that your, your model is universally valid. Well, here's another application of economics to history, the idea of cycles. It's also, I think, a, a way in which history um, can um, uh, improve economic analysis. We know there are cycles. Why are there cycles? In a typical historical cycle, societies are, are, are said to swing like pendulums between alternating phases of vigor and decay progress and reaction, licentiousness and puritanism. That's a very profound theme in historical, historians' ideas of cycles. Each outward movement produces a crisis of excess, which leads to a reaction. And so the equilibrium position is almost, there is a notional equilibrium, but you never really get there. You're always swinging past it. Um, and here's an example of one, which I've always thought rather interesting. It was done by an American um, historian, political economist called Arthur Schlesinger. And he defined a political economy cycle as a continuing shift in national involvement between public purpose and private interest. The swing he identified was between a liberal what we would, I think, in, in, in Europe call social democratic uh, society and a conservative epoch, which I suppose is right-wing. And the idea of crisis is central. You see, you have these liberal periods or social democratic periods. Um, they succumb to the corruption of power as idealists yield to time servers. And then you have, they're succeeded by conservative um, uh, uh, eras, um, which then succumb to the corruption of money. 
as financiers and businessmen use the freedom of deregulation to rip off the public. Now, you fit that in to, say, what happened between 1970 and today, and you see that it's rather good. It makes a rather good fit, because what succumbed in the 1970s was the social democratic era, the liberal era in, 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 in American terms. I mean, this was the era of the great society programs of the 60s in Europe. You had, it was social dem democracy. And social democracy so collapsed. And it, if you look at it from a very narrowly economic point of view, let's say Milton Friedman point of view, it's because it ran into a problem of inflation. But if you look at it in this broader, broader context, you could say it collapsed because of a corruption of power. It thought it could do too much and get, get results that were actually in excess of, of, of its capacity. And so it overstrained itself. It then collapsed, and then it was succeeded, as we know, by, by, by um, the conservative period. Now, if you look at the conservative period, you can also think of it in narrow, narrow terms, in narrow economic terms. This was the era of monetarism. It was the era of um, um, you know, state withdrawal um, um, and, and, and curtailment of welfare entitlements, abandonment of, 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 a, of a, a full employment commitment, and basically a, a, a revived faith in the market. And so the market was going to really produce the, 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 out, the, the beneficial outputs which the uh, social democratic regime had failed to do. You say, you leave it to the market. And, and of course, you've also eliminated power. But then what, what is growing up is the power of money um, in, the conservative, in the conservative regime. And finally, finally, the power of money, um, the invisible power, which we were talking about, brings the conservative regime to an end, because it's the corruption of money that brings about huge crises and uh, everyone turns against it. If you're a cynical person like uh, Pareto, you say, well, all we're having here is a circulation of elites going on. You know, one elite is, 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 gives way to another elite, and they're both equally corrupt. And they're, they're both equally prone to them, both sorts of corruptions, the, the corruption of power and the corruption of money. But if you're, if you're like Arthur Schlesinger, who's basically a social democrat, you sort of think there are some good periods at any rate, and that the, uh, the liberal period could be made into a good period, and the conservative period never can be. But he's sufficiently detached to understand that there are these pendulum swings. I don't want to say uh, too much more because I think uh, the subject is a very big one and um, it can, uh, it can um, uh, develop in all kinds of ways, but just let me come to my conclusion. Since the absorption of modern economics into the mainstream, uh, in intellectual mainstream in the 18th century, economics um, has played um, a part in reshaping the motives and actions of economic agents, including governments. So economics has influenced the course of history. Rational economic calculation, uh, which may be inherent in human beings as they struggle to make ends meet, has far greater scope for expression, I think, today than it did in the past, when custom was paramount. So how human beings behaved in the past is not necessarily a secure guide to how they behave today. But equally, how they behave today is not a secure guide as to how they will behave tomorrow. So I think the contingency is, is the point I would emphasize, the contingency of economic theorizing. History teaches us that economy is a path dependent. Their present is inherited from the past. So understanding a, a community's history can help one, uh, help one estimate its economic possibilities. The present and the future are connected to the past um, by the continuity of society's institutions. I think that's pretty evident. Conventional economic policy is still different in German-speaking countries from um, uh, English-speaking countries, and indeed from um, uh, Latin America. They have different types of economic policy. They have different institutions. They have different 
economies, or rather the weight of, of economics is different. It's true that there's been a huge intellectual colonization by American economics of the economics of everyone else, and that if you really want to make it in the starry heights of economics, you have to be in America. No one makes an economic reputation in, in Uruguay or Mont. You know, they, you, go to, you go to Harvard, you go to Chicago. One time it used, to, it used to be Oxford and Cambridge, but they've also faded away. So America has been dominant, but maybe China will, will, will gradually um, 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 take its place. So how can history make economics better? Let me sum up as follows. Guard against elementary mistakes. If you are just staring at numbers and looking for correlations, um, obvious explanations like there was a war on may escape you. Show economists that their apparently universal theories are not universal, but highly contingent on time and place, challenging them to produce better or more modest theories. Specify the historical conditions from which a particular line of re reasoning arose and to which it applies. Assess the case for its extension to other conditions and other times. In other words, you have to make a case always for saying, look, this applies elsewhere. Don't just assume it does. Five, describe long-duration events like epochs and cycles that would escape the perspective of all but those drenched in history. This may prove useful to economists in showing them appropriate time limits to their inquiries. By understanding how the economics of the past were shaped by conditions and attitudes, we place ourselves in a better position to assess the economics of the present and to interrogate our own biases. And finally, by understanding what questions a theory was trying to answer, we may be able to adapt it for modern use whenever the need arises. This is, um, this is something I touched on when I talked about the value of the study of the history of ideas. The history of ideas is a great arsenal from which we can draw, but we have to be sure, or not sure, but we have to have an idea that they apply to the problems we're interested in. And unless in a historical perspective, uh, on economies can give you an idea um, to what problems pat uh, particular theories um, can be applied. So I think economic history and the history of ideas work together in that, in, the, in, that, in that sense. You have this arsenal of ideas. History tells you to which epoch they're best suited. And all of that, uh, to me, is very relevant because what lessons of the past can we apply to the crash of 2008? If we just interrogate neoclassical economics, we don't get very, very far. It shouldn't have happened. Yet, when we know that um, uh, it's one of a series of disasters that has you know, continually afflicted economies, we begin to say, well, what is it that's wrong in our, in our theory? And how can we put it right? So I think um, economic history is, is a very valuable tool. I hope I've made the case for economic history being a very valuable tool for economists.